again, we're going to summarize and try to reiterate what we've said over and over again in past videos that you would have to go through the archive list to get to. But we're trying to now, uh, you know, bring it into a conclusive understanding so that you don't keep on swaying around inaccurate concepts and then wonder why you're living in the manner that you are at the moment and why you're finding it very hard to proceed forward. The term public. Look at where the, even the roots of that word kind of come into, especially in the New Testament. We hear about publicans. They were tax collectors. If you're a member of the public, you are a member of the tax. Does that make sense? Well, your surname is taxable property. It's state property. It's secular property. It relates to those that don't have grace. It is of a Gentile origin. It does not predate the use of a given name. It came after the fact. And therefore, it's an additional name. It was never required in common law. What we've walked into is attaching to it in simplicity. So if you've attached your given name to the surname, you've attached private property with public property. But to use the public property, you would have to take your individual right and give that up to use the other. So therefore, you're no longer in the same position as you were without it. Your proper name is your given name. Funny the word proper is in the word property, not by coincidence. So the real property is in your given name. A fictional idea of property in value is with the surname. The tax is basically based on a common usage of something that does not belong exclusively to you. Even though other people may have a given name similar to you, it is still something that is bestowed upon you as a gift. It's yours to use, to identify you. It's one. It's individual for you. Because if you're John and they see your face, that's John. They know it's not a John who looks different. And you don't need a surname to make yourself look any different. It would just be identifying you as an involvement in something that would cause you to possibly walk into encumbrances and obligations that you may not have known. And because you did not know of the assurance of your given name, ignorance is no excuse in the eyes of the law and do not expect the court or anybody else to tell you who you are. And you will require faith and courage to speak truth because it's so easy to rationalize to say, I have to say the other name. So how are you going to walk? Well, you cannot use public and not pay for it. Therefore, that is a tax return. That's why you fill out tax returns for using something that's taxable. That has to do with title. I used to make a little bit of a joke that tax stood for title absolute wrong. Because if you really don't know whose title has graced you your life back by acceptance, you won't be at one. You won't will have atoned in the situation because you haven't accepted who atoned for you. And therefore, the jurisdiction of Christ is always known to be in that given name. That calendar from AD on is his. So our misunderstanding of the, of the name itself, which is what we do every day when we're involved in contracting or involved in speaking, is very important. 
because it lets them know who you are. By proceeding to not listen to this point that we've just talked about, you're just blindly walking because you don't want to hear it at that point because it's not convenient to all the possessions you may have accumulated with it. Easier for, as the King James said, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. One rendering actually read it as it would be easier for basically a rich man to basically have to give up his possessions? Is that what they were saying? To get into the kingdom of God? Did he actually really have to dispossess? But in rendering the closest to the Aramaic was a thread or a rope to go through an eye of a needle. It wasn't impossible for him to get in there, but he was probably going to be more wrapped up on the idea that he had a lot of things in this world. And those things, those animate things, are only pursued by people who aren't spiritual. And therefore they say it's mine. Well, they have to pay for what they declare to be theirs because it's really not theirs. It's really the debt of another. And they're shirting it by trying to hold on to it. And they can't take it with them, so it makes no sense to waste any further time trying to debate this fact. The only difference between a rich man who dies and a poor man is the, probably the cost of the coffin. Public, private, do we know what that is now? Do we know what has happened when we took what is private and we put it into the public? You had to give up what was private in order to secure what was a common share within the public. And therefore, if you're involved in that arrangement, you must pay the tax. And that's the money, and that's the duty, the debt, and the obligation. Now, what would be the quickest way to not be involved in this? Which could be the harder journey for most. Wouldn't you have to quit claiming the property of another, in order to do that, maybe we want to look up the term quit claim. Quickest way to give back property of another to eliminate the idea of the concern, the duty, the debt, and the obligations that come with it. But if you continue to use what belongs to another and just to walk away from the debt and still have the debtor's identification symbol in your name, well, then they will chase you <laughs> and they'll increase further bills on what you walked away from. They'll be charging you further interest, further penalties. It is an absolute 100% severing cutoff you must do. So my belief from what I've researched is coming in the next video. I hope you take the time to kind of look at that finding and try to find what's wrong with it if there is something wrong with it. I don't want to hear the word inconvenient. <laughs> I don't want to hear, oh, it doesn't feel good to do that. Is it truthful? Does it make logical sense? Does it follow the points in scripture? Did Jesus own property on this planet? When he was here, did he claim Caesar's property? I saw no evidence of it anywhere. But I did see the evidence of many people selling their estates, placing it all, not a tithing, into the hands of the apostles and telling them to disperse of it for what they saw fit to do with it for charitable good. Why is it that he told the rich man, sell everything you have, give to the poor, then come follow me? Maybe someone had to go through that procedure first and then clean their slate. Now, we know there are some that do not have anything in that world accumulated. Well, maybe they're much more blessed right now with less to worry about because it appears the burden seems to be more upon those who still have been imprinted to believe they have something. And even though this may seem a little bit off subject, 
just to clarify the times that are showing on the map right now of economic concern, you must realize if you live especially in Canada, that most of our manufactured goods here that still are manufactured, we understand that our wages here are quite high to manufacture something. Where's the sale going? Well, that's controlled through agreements that maybe allows our markets to go only to certain markets and sometimes a preventative market in a third world country or a more struggling country or a country that has very cheap labor to not be able to enter into that market for the time being. So there are manipulative things that can go on behind the scenes that may look like, boy, that job that's paying $32 an hour in a manufacturing factory here that's selling its goods into a North American market or some designated market, especially the United States, because they can still purchase those products doesn't mean it's going to continue. And the factoring reality is all the, all the uh, countries such that have very cheap labor, such as India and China, have almost dominated the manufacturing field now. It's almost hard pressed to find a product that doesn't say made in China or in India because their labor is so much more, <laughs> I wouldn't want to say cost effective, I would just say so dirt cheap that they can just almost make anything for next to nothing. So what is going to prevent your job in that world that manufactures currently if you're still involved in a plant or a factory that manufactures something? What would prevent that from ever going into those countries anyways? What guarantee do you really hold in your hands from the company you work for that could give you that 100% position of no worry, no anxiety? Now, in the event the U.S. collapses economically with its huge burden of debt, which we can never, ever foresee being paid out due to its trillions upon trillions of dollars of debt, if they collapse and they're buying most of the products that are manufactured from Canada, where that's mainly where it goes, who's going to feed those people that have been working in those positions here that have been part of the products that were shipped over there. Well, you know where that manufacturing is going to go when the United States can't pay for it anymore. And at the same time, who's going to be able that don't, they do not have a job even to buy products that are shipped in from China to over here for retail sale. You can only move this around so much and it's eventually going to catch up somewhere. There are trying times coming. And people's value in this world, not invaluable, not their spiritual invaluable position, their only valuable designated position is based on their labor, their occupation, and their surname. And therefore, if there's no value anymore being created by that name, because there's nothing they can do anymore, could they be designated as a useless eater? Someone that doesn't be, does not, is not required any longer to be on the planet. It's not because of the fact that there isn't room on the planet for everybody to live under the current population that we say is a huge population explosion. It's because it's not organized properly. You could fit the entire population of the world into a very small part of the United States. It's our problem with the money and greed and our secular driving force every man for himself that's causing the problem and our participation in the problem that we complain about daily because we keep on increasing and trying to salvage something that's already bankrupt and dead and therefore the government's already got the same thing happening right within the birth records in symbolization of it that everybody's born dead in sin. But if you want to try to make and earn your salvation out of that, you can go spin your wheels because 
the scripture does not lie and it says that the wealthy and the rich will actually steal from the hired hand and the Lord of Sabbath will hear their cries. But they will not be paid. They will get nothing because the intention of the game anyways was to provide nothing. Zero. Because if you can't choose what side you're on, you get a big fat zero. And you will be consenting as a prostitute working for another in common because of your lack of knowledge. Just as it was with the Israelites, my people will perish due to lack of knowledge. Well, that's what's going on worldwide. So there is a big separation coming and a big wake up and smell the coffee. And the information that we're saying is not going to do well with those who think they actually have wealth. So our last video will clarify again what I've found in research, which I've been holding back for a while. And what I believe what I would do in the procedure to proceed, whether or not I receive in any manner any support for my direction on a spiritual level to walk this. But I know I must walk it because I must walk in truth, not in fiction. Remember what God hates the most is a liar. So how could we be involved in anything that involves a legal fiction? That's a legal lie. You cannot run from these words.